the good old days. Let me take you back, back to the good old days. Let me take you back, back to the good old days. Let me take you back. Salo falava, malo le sui fua, moe male langia mama. Mi san polevinaka, kimuni saka na wakanda mai viti. Hello everyone, and welcome to Talanoa Tupe. The 2020 general election will now be held on the 17th of October, along with the end of life choice and cannabis referendums. This episode is our election special, so we're going to do things a bit differently today. We're sitting down with Basavika candidates from Labour, National and the Green Party to find out about their respective journeys and their motivations for putting themselves forward. We also have a set of political questions that we will ask each of the candidates to answer for you to compare and make an informed decision. Let's hear from our candidates. Kia ora Natiano, thank you for joining us on the show. Kia ora, great to be here. Yeah, it's good to have you. Yeah, Avalon Studio, I was just thinking of, about what now actually. <laughs> yeah, the very same building. Yeah, probably the same room. <laughs> <laughs> so Tiano, you've described yourself as uh, being tangata whenua as well as basifika and Māori on both sides. So can you tell us a bit about your family and um, how they've shaped you? Yeah, so I'm tangata whenua and tangata moana, so you know, land and sea. Um, my mother's from Ngāpui and from Ngāi Tokoto, so right up north, and my father was, is from the Cook Islands. Um, my, 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 on my Pacifica side, just like a, a lot of Pacifica families, they moved here for educational opportunities and better jobs and all that kind of thing. Uh, my parents, I would say, probably had a classic South Auckland uh, uh, marriage. They met on the doorstep of the pub. My dad was the bouncer. My mum was trying to get him with ID. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, the, my story would be the typical story of a working class family in South Auckland. Mm. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Cool, I'm from Southside as well. Are you? Yeah. There you go. <laughs> um, so you've had a very interesting life. So you've worked at the United Nations and you've lived overseas. What brought you back home? Yeah, I asked, that, I asked myself, I asked my wife that actually, because we went back to Palmerston North and was like, oh, because we lived in Palmerston North for a little bit and then we went overseas to Europe and lived in Paris for a little bit, then we went back to Palmerston North. Probably what really brought us back, in particular to the Manawa too, was ensuring that our children had a New Zealand education. Yeah. Um, my children are Māori speaking children, my wife is Māori as well, so they go to Kohanga Reo, Kura Kaupapa and Wharekura and those sort of things, so commitment to that way of uh, education was really important yeah. for us as well. And so I'm also passionate about um, Pacifica bilingual education because we also know that when children are grounded in their identity and, you know, of course, language and culture plays an important part of that, then that makes them more rounded people and, of course, sets them up for that uh, in terms of that foundation for everything. Mm. So that must have been quite difficult to maintain when you were overseas, right, the um, te reo Māori. Yeah, yeah, my, I, um, I did French. I studied French for about two years. I lived there for two years. Um, my kids didn't do any any French lessons at all. In three months, they're talking better French than me, and I was. <laughs> it's not yeah, I'd be cruising around, and they'd be like interpreting for me in different places. You have uh, a family, so you've got four children, uh, and you're balancing that with um, your political life as well as um, you're an activist as well. So, how do you find time to balance all of those things? Um, well, I've been political my entire adult life. It's like it's. You know, the activism thing is not a new thing for me. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up in a family that was um, that was political. Like one of my earliest memories is going with my mother to the Springbok um, to a protest as well. Mm -hmm. um, and my father was a, uh, grandfather was a trade unionist. He was involved in the in, in, in the labour movement. Um, and he also he was really uh, he was really involved in organising within our community as well. So those two things have been really part and parcel of the way that I've been brought up as well. Um, in my formative years, when I was at university, that's when I started to learn about all the stuff around, um, around, around racism, around the land wars, the Treaty of Waitangi, um, and of course, like the Dawn Raids and inspirational groups like the Polynesian Panthers. And so uh, 
at that time, that's when I started to become more politically aware and became more politically engaged. It had always been around me, you know, ever since I was a child and stuff like that, but I never really paid much of attention to it until I was actually at university when I could do courses and I learnt about um, different ways that explained uh, the reality that I was living in. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So it seems like you need quite thick skin to be a politician. So you ran at the last election and you ran for mayor of Palmerston North. What is it that um, you know keeps you, well, motivates you to keep putting yourself out there? Uh, I haven't really had much of a hard time, to be honest. Um, uh, I mean, because I've, I've done the activism thing for quite some time, so there are always going to be people that don't like the way that you think or don't like your values or don't like your political beliefs. Fine, that doesn't really phase me at all. It never has. Um, and the other thing is, like, when I, I think of colleagues of mine and friends of mine that work in this area who are women, particularly brown women, the amount of toxicity that is thrown in their way mm -hmm. because they are women mm -hmm. uh, makes me check myself, to be honest. And so I, I, I guess in terms of having a hard skin, a tough skin, I think that is really important. But I think one of the problems out there is uh, toxic masculinity. And, um, and I think that's pervasive through politics. Mm. So that's something that you're working towards changing? Yeah, totally. Yeah, no, I'm totally supportive. Like we have to change that as a culture in terms of how we do politics as well. And I, I guess the thing with that is toxic people and toxic politics, they do that so people like you and me don't participate. You know, it's mm -hmm. actually a strategic way that they organise themselves. They make it so dis distasteful, so toxic that the ordinary person who's, this is actually what it's all about, does not participate in the political process. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important that we push back against that. Um, we look to make connections across uh, our diverse communities to make ourselves stronger and safer and, and all that kind of stuff, but we don't give in. So this time round, you're number eight on the Greens list, um, and uh, which means that you've got a pretty good chance of, of getting in this time if the Greens maintains its current levels of support. Um, and you would be the first Basifika Greens MP if you were to be successful. Why do you think that hasn't happened earlier, given that there seems to be um, alignment between Pacific people's concerns about the environment and the Greens co-papa? Yeah, good question. Um, the way that the way that the list is determined is that all members are able to vote on it, and there's two rounds: there's the initial list, and then there's the second round of lists as well. Um, so I couldn't honestly answer what everybody was thinking when they were listing that. But I do know that with me now at number eight and with us, if we are able to maintain the support that we have, that I will be in there. Um, and that over the, particularly over the last couple of years, people have really come on board with recognising that Pacifica people are actually at the front lines of climate change, mm -hmm. particularly when we think of our relatives out there on our home islands, uh, living on the low-lying atolls as well. Mm -hmm. So that is something that has grown as well. And I just wanted to, Acknowledge, acknowledge the really strong uh, youth um, leadership in terms of climate action that we have in our country as well. And so another one of our candidates, uh, Lord Esvano, uh, was, a, was active in organising in the school climate strikes as well. She's also from the Cook Islands. Uh, we've got a couple of Pacifica candidates and uh, we all have whakapapa to the Cook Islands. I think uh, Mark Sumiona is also from Aitutaki and Lord is from Aitutaki as well. And so, I, and I'm from the island of Achu as well. Uh, they have other connections to different other Pacific islands as well. Mm -hmm. So that awareness has definitely grown in the Greens. So um, Pacific leaders have said that um, climate change is the number one threat facing our region. Do you think that here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, we're doing enough to address the climate emergency? I, th I think we've, I think with the Zero Carbon Act, that's a good first step, but we need to ramp up climate action. Um, we need to really think seriously about how we're going to mitigate our, um, our emissions and we have to be resolute in that. Uh, we signed up to the Paris Climate Treaty and um, I know that some of the other political parties now want to pull back from that. I, I think it's really important that we honour our commitments. Uh, I think the Pacific Islands are ex have an expectation that we're all honour our commitments as well. Mm -hmm. And it is about emissions but it also is about a just transition, so making sure that people can move from you know, jobs, say for example, within the fossil fuel um, industries, to jobs that are, you know, to do with the, with the clean economy. And so uh, one, of, one of our things that we're campaigning on this year is on clean economy, and we um, launched a clean energy plan as well. And then that is around about trying to create an industry training plan for those types of jobs. Mm. Yeah, I think that that is really important and probably good to show that it's not um, an either or. 
economy, economy or the environment? I, I think um, without a, without an environment, a strong environment, and of course acknowledging that people are actually part of the environment, we know that as Pacific Island people, um, that you cannot have an economy. It's you must have that foundation and then you put your economy on top of that. Without the environment, no economy. Mm. So uh, when you were at the United Nations, you represented indigenous communities in climate negotiations. Um, I think that must have given you a really um, interesting perspective working with different indigenous communities yeah. throughout the world. So what, kind of, what kinds of things do you think that we can learn from yeah. our indigenous brothers and sisters? I've, I've been working in and around the United Nations for over 20, I think over 20 years, and I've worked as part of the UN uh, with different NGOs, with, directly with indigenous peoples, with Tangata Whenua organisations here as well. So I kind of know the ins and outs and bits and pieces and so on and so forth. So I've worked with rainforest communities as well. Um, I worked on a project in the Morovo Lagoon in the Solomon Islands uh, for a number of years, which is looking at the intergenerational transmission of knowledge, the knowledge of indigenous peoples from the elder generation to the younger generation. And what I find, um, whether it's talking to rainforest people or people, Aboriginal communities in the Northern Territories or folks from the Amazon, is uh, that awareness that we are all connected, that, that we are part of nature, that we aren't separate. Uh, scientists, uh, funny enough, come to this realisation or um, later to the picture than, than Indigenous peoples. And so for me it's about uh, recognising that a lot of the solutions to the issues that we're facing are with Indigenous peoples um, and that is a way for us to map an alternate path which is uh, opposite to the corporatisation uh, of, uh, of nature. Yeah. Seems like a, a very valuable lesson um, for people to learn and particularly in an environment where um, I guess a lot of emphasis is put on uh, economic value. Yeah. Mm. So uh, in one of the um, uh, talks I saw that you gave, you mentioned uh, a concept about um, the relationship between nations in the Pacific and how they're broader than the Western um, ideals of a nation state. Could you elaborate on that a little bit further? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I guess uh, if we were to look, if we, uh, for me, I, I consider ourselves as Pacific peoples, as citizens of an ocean state, if you like. I mean, it is the ocean that actually connects us. Um, we have these uh, little dots of land out there, out there in the Pacific, and um, and so our relationships to the ocean and our relationship to each other. Because if you look at the broader history of the Pacific, um, we are all connected in some way. Mm -hmm. And so I I see New Zealand as just another Pacific island. Uh, we're on an, we're on we're on an island here. Um, uh, Te Ika Maui, and we have Te Wai Pounamu, but these are also islands which are in the Pacific as well. And I would like to see us refocus the way that we, as as people that live in Aotearoa, uh, how we look at ourselves and how we look at ourselves in the relationship to the to the Pacific. So I uh, I guess I, I see that 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 way as a really uh, different way of pivoting in terms of how we would understand ourselves, but also how we might pivot towards the future as well. I mean, this is something that we as Pacific people have known for a very long time, yep. that we are related to one another. We just have to be louder and more bolder and prouder about it, I think, as well. Because um, the other thing I think is what's really unusual, I think, I've found about New Zealand is when I have lived overseas, it's one of the only countries in the world where you have a large percentage of the population that are only monolingual. Mm -hmm. You have, you know, a lot of people here only speak English. Mm -hmm. And that is really, really unusual in the, in the world. You walk around Sydney, you're going to hear 50 different languages, London, um, and of course all throughout the islands. But yet we have the most culturally, linguistically diverse uh, populations here in the Pacific. I mean, the Solomon Islands, they speak umpteen number of languages and they're around Papua about a thousand in Papua same, yeah. as well. Yeah. And then of course, like in the Cook Islands where I'm from, there's, uh, there's linguistic diversity is there, uh, uh, there as well with, you know, with Puka Puka and then Rarotongan and then of course what they speak up in Tongareva as well. So it's, it's, it's a good thing and it's an aspirational thing and I think it's the way that we understand ourselves, our place in the world and where we should be actually organising ourselves in the future. Mm. So Rio is something that's very important to you, so you are trilingual? Um, I, I'm, I'm 
because I've spent most of my life in New Zealand, I'm really fluent in English and my mother's language. My mum's uh, New Zealand Māori. Uh, when I, I lived in the islands for a little bit as a child and I could speak Cook Island Māori then. Uh, I can pretty much understand everything in Cook Island Māori, but I've got a really, honestly, real terrible New Zealand Māori accent. <laughs> I have been told by my relatives. Yeah, so that, when I'm over back in the islands, I give it a go, give me a funny look, and then I switch into English. So, yeah. How similar are the languages? Honestly, I can't really tell the difference often between what is Cook Island Māori and what is New Zealand Māori. It's just really like the accent and the different dialects and stuff like that. Um, it's probably because I've, I've been uh, been going to these different uh, organi uh, community organisations my entire life that you just you just kind of pick it up, you know. Mm. Yeah. So I can, in terms of understanding both of them, they're very similar. So similar for me that I often can't tell the difference. Mm -hmm. yeah. And your children speak Te Reo Māori? Yeah, New Zealand Māori, yeah. yeah. New Zealand Māori and um, yeah, I guess that it takes a lot of effort, right, to maintain a bilingual household. Yeah. Yeah. So is it um, uh, New Zealand Māori at home and then yeah. school? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because they're going to learn English anywhere um, and uh, the, the the good thing about Palmerston North is that there are some really solid Māori language speaking communities and uh, we live in one. Um, and so you know you made it when your kids are having an argument at full bore in the supermarket in Māori. Oh awesome, <laughs> great. Yeah. And no one else can understand too. So oh, there's, there's, a bonus, a yeah. there's a few Māori language speakers <laughs> around every now and then they can like you run into them like oh okay. Yeah. So so why did you choose to move to Palmerston North? I followed my wife there. Mm, yeah we were like a good uh, reason. Yeah, yeah 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 she was like she was finishing her degree this is a while back and she said we were going to be there for three months. Yeah, so 15 years and three more kids, that three months hasn't ended yet. Mm. Um, yeah, but I, I, I like it. I love, the, I love the community. There's diverse communities there. Um, it, there's, you know, it's a, one of the refugee resettlement areas as well. So, oh, okay. um, and then you've got the Army Base, the Air Force Base, you know, like communities that have been there since the year dot as well. Um, so it's, it's, it's a good place to be, mm. yeah, a good place to raise kids. So is it difficult to raise your kids away from your support networks? Um, I, my support networks, I've got pretty strong support networks in, in the Palmerston North. You take oh, you your do. community where you go, you know. Yeah. Um, and I, I probably learned that, I think I learned that from my grandfather who was a really community person. You know, it's not just about yourself, it's also about the community and if you make it then you've got an obligation to turn around and pick up the person behind you. Um, and so wherever you are, that's where your community are and you make a point to you know, jump in and organise. So um, in Palmerston North, I'm well, well, well known around Palmerston North for organising on lots of different issues. So we had, um, I had some rangatahi reach out to me that needed supports um, organising Black Lives Matter uh, rally as well. So I was um, pretty stoked to do that and everybody came out and support. We had a really positive, positive time together. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, so there's been like a huge, uh, there's been huge support all around New Zealand for Black Lives Matter. And um, as well as standing in solidarity with uh, uh, people in the States, um, you know, one of the things that's come through is that a lot of rangatahi feel like um, they can relate on some level to the systemic racism. So what do you think, um, you know, the parts of the system that are not working well in New Zealand? Um, well, a lot of the similar issues around, um, you know, racial profiling by the police and institutions, um, and this whole concept, uh, whole conversation about systemic racism is really, really important conversation to have, um, because it's you can still have, uh, you know, it's not about a bunch of racists within the system. It's actually about if you had zero racists within the system and the system was still uh, sy uh, systemically biased against racial groups, then the outcomes would still be racist. So these are the conversations that we need to have. It's not just about individual bias, but of course if that's happening and it's incredibly toxic and dangerous, and I think of the white supremacist terrorists who, um, who attacked the mosques down there as well. When they mm. get toxic, you have to deal with it. When they get dangerous, you have to deal with it. But we also have to look at, at the underlying causes which actually creates people like that. Mm. Um, and that's where education comes in uh, and is really, really important. So one of the things that we want to do is around civics education, so making sure that you know young people can actually participate in the system, they learn about it, what it means, all this other kind of stuff. But there's another dimension to that, and that is about learning to be a critical thinker, and also learning to know where your information is coming from. Is yeah. it from a reliable source? Because mm. one of the things that I've experienced on this um, this campaign is a, a larger number of conspiracy cranks coming up to me and climate change deniers who don't want to believe the obvious science. 
um, because it's actually disappeared down some, um, you know, some uh, rabbit, uh, YouTube rabbit hole. Mm. And so we need to, uh, you know, give our people the, the tools to actually discern what is, what is knowledge and what is, what is not. Mm, question where your information is coming from and yeah um, yeah that's a yeah a, a very worthwhile pursuit <laughs> okay so that's it for for this um, part of the the questions and I have a few more questions coming up uh, Tiano what is your party's vision for Pacific peoples in the next term well, there's a whole lot of things that we want to do. Um, and so we're campaigning on healthy nature, fairer communities and a clean economy. Uh, but specifically for Pacific peoples, um, like for example, uh, we've released a Homes for All uh, policy, because um, we know that um, uh, many of our Pacific people don't have, uh, own, don't own their own homes as well. So in that, in that package is talk about these bits on progressive um, ownership, uh, but also uh, making sure that we, uh, have a warrant of fitness for rental homes as well because many of our families are renting as well and that's to make sure that our families are healthy as well. So in terms of the health issues, uh, we think that we should be directly supporting uh, Pacific health providers as well because they know how to work with our people. You know, we talked just uh, briefly before about systemic racism. Who knows how to deal with systemic racism Pacific, as it impacts Pacific people than our own people ourselves. So making sure that they get, a, get some support would be, is also really important. There's a whole lot of stuff that we want to do in the education space, continue to do in the education space as well. Um, uh, there, was some, there was promises made about making sure that our Pacifica bilingual education units got some funding as well. Um, whether that was COVID or whatever, that funding hasn't materialised. So hopefully, maybe by the time that this airs, that will be sorted out, but that is something that is definitely a priority for us, because as we know, um, uh, when a child uh, speaks their language and has their culture and all of that kind of stuff, uh, it creates a really strong foundation for them in terms of the education and the way that they move forward as well. And also a part of that, what we want to see is a way to make sure that when Pacific people come over from the islands with their teaching qualifications, that there is some way that they can be registered to teach here as well, mm -hmm. because It'd be really what what's really good about people coming from the islands is they generally have our lang our heritage languages with them, and having those people in front of our children is a good thing. And so we need to find ways to actually support them to do that. Um, I did notice uh, a couple of weeks ago there was a petition that went to Parliament, which was about supporting uh, Pacifica people that were trapped here after the after the lockdown as well. I understand it's around about 4,000 to 5,000 people as well. And what that was about was ensuring that there was a pathway for citizenship for those Pacifica peoples as well. So I would see it really as a really important thing to make sure that we as Greens support that as well. Um, it's no fault of theirs that they're here as well. And as we talked earlier, uh, New Zealand is a part of the Pacific. So we have to treat people from the Pacific, not as if they are foreigners, but as they are but as if they are not only our neighbours but our relatives and friends and family as well. So those, mm. those are some of the things that we want to do. What is your party's plan for the economic recovery and how do Pacific people fit in that? Uh, we think the, the economic recovery needs to be a green uh, recovery as well. Uh, in the, during the first lockdown we were successful in getting $1.3 billion in green jobs, so jobs for nature as well, so that's 11,000 jobs right across the whole, whole, whole country as well. Um, we, in our clean energy plan is why we want to make sure that there are ways for people to transition into renewable jobs as well, because all jobs can be green. It's not just about conservation jobs, but just the way that we do any, mm -hmm. any, anything. Uh, because we know that just coming down, down the highway is after the COVID crisis, the climate crisis as well. So if we think ahead and plan, then we can deal with these things in a more appropriate way. Uh, so definitely jobs. Um, homes for All, uh, we talked about a little bit about that earlier, progressive ownership, making sure that happens, supporting community health providers uh, to build homes, um, supporting progressive ownership, but also making sure there's a better, a better quality of uh, homes that are warm for, for tenants as well. That's also really important because some of our families will be renting their homes as well, making sure that that is there. Um, yeah. And of course the whole climate thing which we were talking about before as well and you know, acknowledging once again the, the leadership of our Pacifica youth and putting climate action on the map here in Aotearoa New Zealand and the way that they have worked in with 
the same voices um, in, uh, in our homelands in the Pacific as well, I think for me has been really inspirational. Mm -hmm. And so uh, in terms of the way where we're heading to the future, I always look to our youth, to our rangatahi, to sort of guide us to where they think we should be going. Mm -hmm. And where I go to, where, where I, what I hear is that they want us to take more stronger climate action to make sure that the climate is stable for them. What would you like people to consider in the upcoming referendum on cannabis? Um, I, th I think, uh, first of all, do all your research. Make sure that you are really well informed. Um, the way that we see this, if you want to look at it from a community wellbeing and harm reduction perspective, uh, this what we've outlined here is actually the right way to go about things. Um, we know when you look at the way that they've implemented similar regimes in places like Uruguay and Canada as well, where you have all the wraparound services for people that know it, that need it, uh, whether that's around um, information, whether that's around uh, you know um, uh, adequate access to healthcare as well, that it actually reduces uh, re reduces use because people are really aware of what they're doing. Because here's the thing, right? People are already using it. 80% of people before they are the age of 21 would have used cannabis. That's 80%. And so we, uh, it's not like we're introducing um, cannabis into the country. It's already here. It's already normalised within New Zealand as well. So we just have to uh, provide all those things around it so that adults are well aware of what they're actually already putting in their bodies. Mm -hmm. And so um, I will be voting yes in the referendum. And what would you like people to consider in the upcoming referendum on uh, euthanasia? Um, so that one's that one um, made it through the the third reading, uh, and I you know I really do um, I, when I've been researching it it's and you hear about some of these stories where the people have terminal illnesses and they are in so much pain and they uh, you know fully cognitive and want to uh, end their lives because of all that um, suffering I I. I really um, like I really support to make sure that those people have that agency in there. I, I do have a concern though that this doesn't uh, take into account those uh, vulnerable and marginalised peoples who might feel pressure that they might have to end their lives because they might be a burden on their families or might be a burden on societies as well. So I have listened to some of my, my friends from the disability uh, uh, community who have those concerns as well. And so um, we supported this uh, right through and it's going to the refer uh, going to referendum and we will support whatever the outcome of that referendum. But at the moment, myself personally, I don't think it goes far enough in terms of supporting the vulnerable people. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, I'm veering towards not supporting it personally. Mm. Just on that, do you think that the act as it um, currently stands has enough safeguards in it? Um, I understand that once the decision's been made, it could um, be yeah. done within two days. Yeah, well, that was that's that was um, that was a conversation that I've been been having with friends of mine that it didn't wrap around enough of that support for vulnerable and marginalised peoples, which is why I kind of veering towards the no on that. But I think I think the process was a good process, um, and uh, putting that to the referendum was a was a good thing to do, and whatever comes out of that, yay or nay, um, you know, we're happy to support it. So, in your uh, so, what's your proudest ach achievement to date? I don't really have one to be honest. I've been kind of doing politics for such a long time. Um, maybe consistency, like I've been at it for such a long time and I'm still here. Maybe, is, I don't know if that's a proud achievement though. <laughs> um, uh, 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 so I've always been committed to the environment. I've always been committed to indigenous people's struggles. Uh, I've always had an active interest in it. I've worked on that within my, um, uh, on social justice issues and environmental issues in my local community across Aotearoa, around the Pacific and, and, uh, and around the world. Um, so being able to continue to do that in different, in different capacities, I think I'll call that an achievement. <laughs> awesome. And so whenever you're done with politics, how do you want to be remembered? Uh, well, I'm not the first activist trying to get into Parliament and I won't be the last. Others have come and gone from me. Um, I would like to be remembered as a person that went in as an activist and left as an activist. And I look to other people that have had, uh, I like to think I'm on a similar trajectory on, people like who I look up to, like uh, Keith Locke, Catherine Delahunty, Sue Bradford, uh, Russell Norman, Hone Harawira, those types of people who went in there you know, battling against injustices in the system on the outside and then doing what they could within the system once they were in there and then continuing to do that when they, when they get out.
as well. I'm hoping that I can be like that. Mm. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the show and all the best with your campaign. Kia manuia. Mai taki mata. Mai taki mata. That's it for today's programme. Remember, the 2020 general election will now be held on the 17th of October. You need to be enrolled to vote in the election and referendums. For further information on how to enrol or vote, please visit vote.nz. See you next time on Talanoa Tupi.